The purpose of these short videos is to review the methodology of the guideline development and the specific guideline recommendations on amino acids in Part 1, and in Part 2, we will review recommendations on injectable lipid emulsions and discuss future research directions. See the full guidelines document for all of the panel's recommendations. Here is the reference for the full recommendations and the panel of workgroup members. I'm Daniel Robinson, a neonatologist and associate professor of pediatrics at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I chaired the guidelines and am representing the work of a committed multidisciplinary group of experts. We know that despite advances in parenteral nutrition or PN formulations, several questions remain. How do we further improve safety? And related to that, how can we optimize long-term outcomes in preterm infants? The purpose of the guideline was to systematically evaluate relevant literature and provide recommendations on key outstanding clinical questions regarding the provision of PN in preterm infants. We included randomized control trials of PN interventions in preterm infants born at a gestational age less than 37 weeks. The population could be exclusively preterm or mixed preterm and term infants, could be at risk for necrotizing enterocolitis or neck or penald, but not already diagnosed with those conditions at study entry, and lastly was managed in the neonatal intensive care unit. We excluded populations already diagnosed with neck or penald, with congenital GI disorders, short bowel syndrome, intestinal failure, and others, as well as those managed in the pediatric ICU. This table summarizes the approach to defining outcomes. For growth, we included weight, length, or head circumference measured at clinically relevant times, such as 28 days of age or 36 weeks corrected age, rather than times during the clinical trials, such as day seven into the trial. We accepted cross-sectional measures at specific points and rates of change. For neurodevelopment, we included cross-sectional measures at six through 24 months, and though we considered many scales, most used the Bailey scales of infant development second or third editions in considering the publication dates. For penald, a serum direct or conjugated bilirubin greater than 2 or greater than 1.5 milligrams per deciliter was accepted, and secondary outcomes included other prematurity-associated morbidities and clinically important outcomes. Each had a specific definition. For instance, neck was Bell stage 2 or greater, defined in the publication, sepsis required a positive culture, etc. Each outcome was clearly defined. Clinical experts abstracted relevant information from each trial into a standardized data abstraction form, or DAF, and discrepancies were reconciled between two reviewers and, if necessary, with the addition of a third reviewer. A separate bias panel of independent researchers assessed bias in each individual study, and for each question, an assessment determined the quality of evidence to answer the specific question and the strength of recommendation was based on the potential for benefit versus harm in consideration of the entirety of data available. Evidence tables and force plots supported the recommendations, and force plots could be generated when three or more studies reported on an individual outcome using the same measure of central tendency. Question two in the guidelines asked, in preterm infants compared to lower doses of parenteral amino acids, do higher doses improve growth outcomes? There were 15 clinical trials that addressed this question. Both the initial and maximum amino acid doses varied in the trials. Initial doses were as low as a half to one gram per kilo per day, and maximum doses also varied. So the lower amino acid randomization group might have been advanced to 2.5 to 3.5 grams per kilo per day, and the higher amino acid group advanced to up to 4.5 grams per kilo per day. In fact, given the study design of the Bloomfield clinical trial, some infants did receive more than 4.5 grams per kilo per day. We were able to assess both short and long-term outcomes, 
meaning growth measurements that occurred during initial hospitalization as well as post-discharge. And measures of weight gain, linear, and head growth were all assessed. So we captured some element of all of these standard, commonly used markers of growth. This table summarizes what we were able to accomplish with combined analyses for growth with high versus low amino acid dose. We could perform combined analysis at the time of 36 weeks postmenstrual age or discharge, and then at two years old, and there were absolute measures of growth as well as standard deviation score assessments at those time points. These were the outcomes for which we could conflate in combined analysis. These two forest plots are representative examples of the plots you'll find in the guideline, listing the specific study, the numbers in each intervention group, measures of central tendency, and either a mean difference for continuous variables or risk difference for dichotomous outcomes. Honing in on the bottom line, we found no difference in any of the growth outcomes in combined analysis when comparing higher versus lower amino acid dose. We were able to perform combined analyses for secondary outcomes, and we found no difference between groups based on amino acid dose. There were a few biochemical assessments in the guideline that we could address, including urea metabolism. More studies assessed markers of ure urea metabolism than we could combine, but they reported in different measures. In those that we could combine, we did not see a difference by amino acid dose specifically for blood urea nitrogen. Regarding the rationale behind the recommendations for amino acid dosing, individual studies found improvements in individual and varied growth measures with higher doses, yet some found better outcomes with lower doses. There are competing interests that must be considered. Concerns of impaired neurodevelopment with higher doses were an influence as I'll detail. And the strong recommendation reflects considering the balance of findings in individual studies and combined analyses for growth as well as additional outcomes. Putting all of this together, we recommended against an initial dose greater than three grams per kilo per day. And in considering the maximal target dose, we recommend providing a minimum of three and not exceeding three and a half grams per kilo per day. This guidance accounted for growth as well as neurodevelopmental outcomes addressed in question three. I've created this table that breaks up our guidance into clinically meaningful pieces, including time frame, infant age, and dosing. For the initial dose, the clinical time frame is when you're initiating PN. For the infants inborn, that would be those admitted directly from the delivery room, or perhaps right at admission for those outborn. The infant age would be zero to one days, and that dosing recommendation, again, is to not exceed three grams per kilo per day. For the maximal target dose, the clinical time frame is after initiation, and you've advanced by whatever rate you deem acceptable in your unit, so the infant's age would vary by NICU, and that highest dose is recommended to be three to three and a half grams per kilo per day. We did not find benefit to a higher dose than that, and as I'll comment on next, there are considerations including brain development. And that brings us to question three in the guideline. In preterm infants, compared to lower doses of parenteral amino acids, do higher doses improve neurodevelopmental outcomes? There were fewer clinical trials that met criteria as compared to those for growth, and one of them had multiple interventions, which meant we could not isolate an effect from the amino acids. The initial and maximum doses varied and were somewhat but not entirely similar to those considered for growth. The instruments used were predominantly the Bailey scale second and third editions, and we considered either the scores as a continuous variable or if the scores had been categorized into specific cutoffs defining impaired neuro neurodevelopment as explained in the manuscript. We also included cerebral palsy diagnosed at any age. The heterogeneity in reporting prevented a combined analysis using Bailey scores. There were too many differences such as in the addition and the age at testing. 
Looking at individual studies, though, a single trial identified lower Bailey score at 18 months in the higher amino acid group, yet no difference at a later age. And we note that the scores in both groups were overall considerably low. We were able to perform a combined analysis for any cerebral palsy documented. In those specific trials, the higher dose amino acid group achieved maximum doses of 3.6 grams per kilo, 4, and an additional 1 gram of amino acids above control. The force plot does not meet significance by the 0.05 cutoff, but the directional consistency in the individual and combined outcomes in favor of lower doses influenced our recommendation. And so, when we considered the maximal target dose, that left us advising not going beyond 3.5 grams per kilo per day. What we also saw was that it is challenging to tease out implications of doses in between 3.5 and 4 grams per kilo per day. There was no glaring, yes, this is a big benefit. In fact, as shown on the prior slide, it may not be benign. Here are the relevant references for this portion, and I thank you for your attention. <music>